Okay, everybody, we might just kick off proceedings there. Um, uh, you're all very, very welcome. My name is Donald Miller, I'm the chairman of the Roads and Transport Society. Uh, it's a very interesting presentation we're going to have tonight. Uh, Dublin Port, Alexandra Basin, the challenge to keep pace with growth. Um, I'd just like to welcome you, welcome you all to tonight's proceedings and thank you for coming. Um, a special thanks go to Eamon, the chief executive of Dublin Port Company, for agreeing to attend tonight and present on the next st stages of the ambitious plans of the Dublin Port Company. Eamon has been a, a valued supporter of Engineers Ireland activities over the years, and uh, if I remember correctly, I think he last presented for us in the Roads of Transport Society for our AGM lecture in uh, May 2012 uh, on the development of their 30-year master plan and the consultation process undertaken to integ integrate the views of the various stakeholders. Um, Tonight's lecture will be a very interesting and timely update, I guess, of, of, of as the evolution of the plan. And funnily enough, as we're, we're converging on the year of 2040, and uh, it'll be an interesting time to get an update as to where, where the plan stands at the moment. Um, more in terms of the detail of the presentation, Dublin Board has commenced work on the Alexandra Basement, uh, Basin Redevelopment Project, the largest sing single project in the port's 300 year history. Um, the scale of future growth and port volumes can be difficult to appreciate, and with the economic recovery underway, the port has already seen 17% growth over the past three years. Uh, this obviously has uh, uh, implications for the port's master plan to 2040 and requires, requires firm views to be taken today on what other major products would be required to cater for the volumes uh, projected to 2040. So in this presentation, Eamon will uh, explore the multifaceted challenge of the, the long-term planning of the port. In terms of Eamon O'Reilly, the Chief Executive of the Port Company, he's an electrical engineer and graduate of UCD. He's worked in engineering, Irish cement and Shannon engineering. And he's worked in consultancy uh, at KPMG and as a self-employed consultant. And in the port sector, uh, Imari Group and Burke Shipping Group. And has been the Chief Executive of the Dublin Port Company since 2010. Um, we'll have a brief session of questions and answers, as is customary, at the end of the lecture. So you might just wait until the end and gather your thoughts, and, and, and we'll, we'll deal with all the questions and answers. or any observations or commentary you want to make on the, on the presentation uh, at that point? Uh, so I'll just hand you over to Eamon then. Thanks, Eamon. Um, thanks a million. Um, you, you used the word multifaceted. There's going to be very little engineering tonight, I'm afraid, if we as much about planning, about finance, about economics. There'll be a bit of history and there'll be a, even a little bit of culture. Um, what I'd like to do, I mean, many of you here will know the port very well, others might not. So I'm going to assume that people actually actually don't know that well. And I'll just give a quick overview about the, the, the physical layout of the port. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of the development of the port. And I think that's very important because I think we find ourselves looking back over our shoulders as much as we do to the future to learn the lessons of the past. So often you hear it that you know we forget the lessons of the past, and we certainly have drawn an awful lot in our thinking for the future and what engineers did with Dublin Port in the past. A brief word on the master plan and why we needed it and the context for it. Talk about the projects that we have in the pipeline today. We've started into our Alexandra Basin redevelopment project, and it is underway. We're awarding our first contract. Uh, and the lessons we've learned from the process of getting planning and how we set about that. One slide with statistics, just one. Uh, I think it's important to look at the numbers, to look at the past and the projected. Um, I think it's always good to have a look at, at other ports and see how do they plan the type of growth that we think we're going to see in Dublin. How do they do it in other countries? I think we often beat ourselves up in Ireland. You know, We're not that good at planning when, in fact, at times we're actually not that bad. But there are lessons we can always learn from other ports. I'm going to look ahead then at development options post-2025. I mean, that might seem an awful long time away, but for the big infrastructure we're talking about, the lead times are very long. And finally, uh, I think it's not too early now for us to be planning what I view as a major inflection point that the port is going to hit in about 2040, an historically important one. So just to start to give a sense of Dublin Port for those who, who aren't as familiar with the port as I think all of us are familiar with the airport. This is a lovely image, I think, looking, looking uh, eastwards out into the bay. Obviously a very busy city, a river with lots of bridges. The bridges over time would have pushed the port eastwards. And the port is almost invisible. Ireland's biggest port is almost invisible, hidden at the, at the very edge of the city. And, and if we look westwards back up, what we see is, in European terms, this is 
one of the busiest ports. It's not the largest, but it's one of the busiest ports that I have seen. Where cheek by jowl you see container terminals, you see cruise ships, there's power stations in there, there's oil tanks, and there's container ships, there's bulk ships, all in a very small space. An engineer would never have designed a new port in the way that Dublin has evolved over, over its long history. Taking a third image of the port are the two, um, the two defining pieces of engineering that make Dublin port the port that it is. The East Coast of Ireland is obviously it's all sand. And when I do presentations to foreign visitors to Dublin, I always use the example of Saving Private Ryan. It fixes in people's mind, that's what the East Coast of Ireland is. Obviously, the great opening scenes all down in Wexford. None of our ports in Ireland are particularly big. We're not blessed with deep water. We have a great harbour in Cork. The water isn't very deep. But on the East Coast of Ireland, we've no natural harbours at all, hardly. And all of our ports are river ports, essentially, with exceptions like Rosslare, which is very small, and, and Greenore. But all of our ports are river ports, and they're built on rivers that just aren't very big. And the two walls in that picture, the Great South Wall on the left side, 1.6 kilometres long today. Originally, it was five kilometres. A lot of infill on the south of it to create what is now the Poolbeg Peninsula. And the Poolbeg Peninsula is coming into focus very sharply for us as a major, um, a major part of our capacity for the future. On the right-hand side, then, is, is the North Pole Wall, and the two of them give us, give us the depth of water we have today. And finally, then, an image of looking over the Poolbeg Peninsula toward, towards Bull Island. And I, just spending a moment just looking at the Poolbeg Peninsula, two power stations, two baseload power stations, ESBs, that between them generate about one-fifth of all of the electricity on the island of Ireland. We have the waste-to-energy plant, or the incinerator, as I think most of us call it, which is going to be burning up to 600,000 tonnes, a colossal industrial undertaking. We have the wastewater treatment plant, which is needed for an expanding population in Dublin. It itself has had plans and probably will in the future for its expansion. And some areas of, of, of port land, you can see a container turf, but other lands that are undeveloped, which are our lands, which are very important to us and which now are, are, are a major focus for, for what we need to, to um, keep control of for the years ahead. If I give a, a quick historical perspective, Fine, fine old engineer, John Purser Griffith. He was the chief engineer of Dublin Port, 1870 to 1913. He took over from probably a better known great engineer, Bindon Bloodstone. He was succeeded by Joseph Mallet. In, in 1887, he gave an address to the Institution of Civil Engineers. And in that, there was a quote, which, which I've always liked. And he said, my objective in dwelling so much upon the history of our profession has been to stimulate you to assist in making its future worthy of its past. Now, he retired in 1913 in frustration that the port wasn't continuing with the development of deep water and deep berths. So an engineer frustrated with not getting his way to develop projects that he thought were needed. And that really is where we are today with so much. We've got an awful lot of things we have to contend with, to deal with, and not to take, in, in my view, take as being barriers, but I think take as things we have to do as engineers to really get into the nuts and bolts of environmental impact, economics, and so on. So the challenges that, that the port faced in, in Purser Griffith's time uh, are pretty much the same as we have today. And those are the challenges to develop deep water berths and a deeper approach channel. And if I just take, take the, the approach channel, we, we've got a number of, like any infrastructure business, a number of places we can have our constraints. We can have it in the channel or on the berths or on the land or on the land side access. And our, our channel constraints are, are largely dealt with now. And th this, this is a graph. It's not exactly linear along the, the, the time axis, but it just gives a sense of the deepening of the port in Dublin from two metres or six and a half feet, I should say, up to 16 feet in 1873 as a result of the building of the, of the North Bull Wall. And, and that table of data is taken from a wonderful engineering paper, which I'd recommend to anybody. Uh, you can actually get, get a copy of it on, on, on Amazon. And the paper was written by Isaac John Mann in 1881, and they didn't win for short titles. He called it River Bars, Notes on the Causes of Their Formation and on Their Treatment by Induced Tidal Scar, with a description of the successful reduction by this method of the bar at Dublin. So 
wonderful pieces of engineering. It, I think, I look at this sometimes, I just look at the numbers. They took Dublin from two meters to 4.9 meters by building a wall. They've created a channel, which is a very stable channel. A channel which today we need to do very little dredging in real terms. On average, we need to dredge about once every two years and dredge quite small quantities. In 1904, uh, the Port and Docks Board bought a dredger called the Sandpiper. They got stuck in, and, and by 1909, they brought the, the depth of the river up to six metres. By the 1970s, it had reached 7.8, and our plans today will see us over the next six years bring it to minus 10 metres at chart Asian. And that's a very considerable, considerable um, progress, but it's a progress over very many decades, indeed over, over centuries. And if I focus just on this dredging for a moment, and I'll come back to this, um, in the first year of the state, and this is from an engineer's report by Joseph Malla, who is the engineer who came after John Purser Griffith. They dredged 780,000 tonnes, and over the remaining years of that decade, a total dredge of 9.5 million tonnes, which is equivalent now to what we're going to do over the next six years. We're about 10 million tonnes, but 6.4 cubic metres. So, what we're doing today is absolutely identical to what the port was doing in the past. The big difference, however, is we're in a very difficult, different regulatory environment and we have different challenges. I think in those days they were able to get on it. Engineering was the challenge. Engineering is no longer the challenge for the delivery of these type of projects. So our channel is looked after. My view is that the land side is actually looked after. We have the Dublin Port Tunnel, we have the M50. There's undoubted challenges ahead with the management of capacity on our, on our motorway network. Um, but I'm very heartened by the recent uh, National Transport Authority's draft transport strategy for the Greater Dublin Area. Again, an organisation that doesn't run for short titles. But they've identified freight as being quite distinct from passengers. In the previous draft transport strategy, they had a hierarchy of, of road users. And you can have an awful lot of movement between between cars and public transport. You, you actually don't have an alternative for freight. And you have to deal with it distinctly and we have to make provision for it. And it's not the most um, uh, popular topic, but we have a huge road network and we have to make sure the capacity is available for what it's, it has to do. And what it has to do is to help move freight. So if the road network is done and the channel is done, what, what challenge do we face? Our challenge today is really mostly about land capacity. And, and on the subject of land capacity, in, in I guess from, from, from a civil engineer's perspective, the good old days of harbour works orders. Harbour works orders are granted by a minister. And that is, harbour works order was essentially a, a grant of planning permission. You got past everything. Once you had your harbour works order, you just got on with the works. So there's a series of, of harbour works orders. And I think it's, it's instructive. And I, I did this at the opening of our planning application with the board Planol. I just stepped through the various ones. And I think this gives a sense of the amount of work that went on in the port starting about 50 years ago. The first harbour works order here, it's from 1966. And it's the development of the first facilities that we had on the south bank of the river. And I should have mentioned that Dublin Port overall, it's around 260 hectares of land, about 40 on the Poolbeg Peninsula, and 220 in round numbers on the north side. So most of our focus is on the north side, but I, I will be coming back to that, that 40. So this was the start of our cargo handling on the south side. A second very big harbour works order, just, just one year later, and that uh, biggest area there is where East Point Business Park now is, but the other areas are now very much part of the port and of port, port handling. 1969 saw that the coming of containerization and unitization. So you're starting to see now where the BNI would have had the first terminal built and where um, British Rail were, were putting in a container terminal. And that would have expanded 1975, 1977. So a lot of expansion on the eastern extremities of the port at that time. Two other small ones, one on the south side. An interest in 1980, the East Link Bridge. East Link Bridge built on the base of a harbour works order. And the East Link Bridge, we had a part interest in it up to, up to last December. Um, we were earning a million euros a year from it up to last December. Now we're earning nothing. It's all going to Dublin City Council. So hopefully they'll, they'll put those, those funds towards the building of, of a better bridge at that location. Um, small little infill in Alexandra Basin. And this is where I think port planning hit the wall. This one here, number nine, 
Dublin Port and Docks Board decided they still needed more land and they wanted 38 hectare. And they submitted for a harbour works order and that was eventually withdrawn. And it was replaced with, with a harbour works order application for a smaller area out to the east. And this is the famous 21 hectares that was looked for by Dublin Port. 21 hectares was looked for for 31 years until in Bolton and all it turned it down in 2010. So in that little presentation, I think you can see the, the, the influence of the engineer coming up against the reality of the modern world. All of Dublin Port, it's squares and rectangles. There's a little angle in there as well. Um, but really at that point, the world was changing. There was people more concerned about the environment. Uh, there was regulation starting to come in and starting to develop. So we enter a very different era where the role of the engineer, I think, in terms of their technical abilities is supplanted by the role of the engineer as a, as a multifaceted wide thinker. And I think that that's where, that's where we are now. I'll just give a quick, quick word of, about the master plan. Um, it was mentioned in the introduction that there was a lot of consultation. That summarized the consultation. But there's three essential commitments we made from the master plan. And the reason we did the master plan was trying to get over the reality of having spent 31 years really getting at people's noses, which is actually what we did. And that's not a criticism of those who pushed that plan, because those were different days. Those were days when companies were investing in other companies who had some handle on port land. The port was going to be moved. Senior politicians in the country, the party of government was saying it. Dublin City Council was publishing in 2007 a plan which the, 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 um, the conclusion of which was that the best outcome for Dublin would be the movement of the port to another location. And the only bit they left was a tiny bit for cruise ships. So that was the environment which the port was looking up to 2010 to get its, its, uh, its planning for the, for the infill. So we needed the master plan to try to re-engage with a whole range of stakeholders. And we made, we made three commitments within that. The first one, I think, is pretty self-evident, uh, but we needed to say it. We're going to maximize the use of the existing footprint to the greatest extent possible. The second commitment was and this has tried to get, get over this historical loss of connection. And it only it didn't happen in Dublin, it's happened all around the world. We had to reintegrate the port with the city. And I'll talk a little bit about that, and that's where a bit of heritage and culture will come into the, the discussion. And the final thing we said, we, we'd keep the plan under review, and, and we're actually at that point already that we do need to review it. So the master plan development options. And there wasn't a huge amount of, of engineering or science or anything else in this. It really was just a coloury chart that identified a number of pretty, pretty obvious options that we had for the future. But we needed to do that. We needed to say we'd be able to handle trade up to 2040 within our footprint. And we were clear from this simple analysis that we could do that. And we also talked about um, channel deepening. Go back to my earlier slide about the progressive development of the channel and up into the 1970s. Since the 1970s, a lot of, lot of ships have got, have got bigger, so many of them have got longer. So we, we decided we would say within the mass plan, look, we're, we're going to look at deepening the port from minus 7.8 to ultimately to minus 12. Minus 12, we think, is probably the limit of where Dublin could, could go. Future generations might, might, might prove me wrong, but um, none of us in this room would be here when that happens. So minus 10 and minus 12 were the two stages that we said we, we would look at over the period of the master plan. So the developments in the first three years, the first thing on, on maximizing the use of land, we, we managed because of this change in, in, in the whole economic climate and the, the people's wild views on the value of land, we managed to get back control on a lot of land and we've redeveloped that. We, we've got about 20 hectares of land in the port, equivalent to what we didn't get planning permission for by way of infill, but we found it within the port and we've redeveloped that. We spent about 18 million euros doing that over the last year, year or so. A bit more we're coming to this year. We finished work on a new container terminal, the third phase of the, the uh, uh, Alexander Key container terminal development. So if you look at the port now, you will see a new yellow gantry crane from Lee Perth, which is being commissioned as we speak. That's part of the, the um, complementary investment with the terminal operator. They're investing about 20 million euros, all told, in handling equipment. We, we built a new terminal for imported cars. That cost about four million. That's that nice curvy bridge. If you're driving to the Dublin Port Tunnel from the south side, you go under this bridge. If any of you have wondered what it was, that's a bridge that we put in to link the port to four hectares of land that were isolated by the tunnel 
where we now put imported trade cards. And that business grew by over 30% last year, and we, we had that there on time, which was lucky. The biggest thing that we've done, however, was, was to get our planning permission for our ABO project. 227 million is what we estimate the cost, 2014 costs. We've got our planning permission. We've got from, from Europe uh, 100 million euros loan facility. It's a, effectively like a tracker mortgage, annuity mortgage. Absolutely essential that you've long-term sensible, stable finance. There's nothing, nothing fancy about it. It's very bog standard, simple debt, but it's what we needed. And we also got 23 million euros of grant from, from Europe. Uh, and construction has started. So all of the above are the, the pieces of engineering and planning we were getting on with. And as we were doing that, growth has come back. In the last, seven, in the last three years, we've grown by 17.3%. And I, I think that level of growth is just extraordinary. And I look a little bit more at some of those figures on my, my one slide of stats. So returning to the master plan in stage one, the, the ABR project deals with three areas of the port. Alexandra Basin, from where the project gets its name. Um, and we're going to rebuild uh, a lot of key walls there. The biggest thing you will see from that part of the development is the coming of the biggest cruise liners in the world up to Eastlink Bridge. This is going to be transformational for the city. We brought some of the biggest ones last year and we had to reverse them up the, the Liffey because it's a bit too narrow. Um, and they would have come uh, into Alexandra Basin, but not up to Eastlink Bridge. There will be two at a time coming in. For us, that's really important. It wasn't a colossally important part of the business. And if we took an engineer's view of the world, or an operator's view of the world, we would have said, you know, we should actually let the cruise business go because the berths that are coming in are much more necessary for the future for cargo. So there was a little bit of a compromise there in our thinking. Uh, logically, pure engineering would say, Cargo works is what you need, because look at the growth you're going to have. But this was an essential part, I think, of us getting our planning permission, part of this multifaceted view of the world. There's a second area. This is an important little area where, where we had two, two berths for our ferries, um, but we didn't have enough land, so we decided to give up one of the two berths and infill, get a better berth on the river, and we get a better balance between land and berth. It's also important for, for something I'll mention in a moment. And the third thing we looked at within the, the master plan was the creation of, of a turning circle for big ships. Now, we've come up with a much better design. We've brought that up to the heart of the port, right into the Alexandra Basin. So not only will you see the biggest cruise ships up by Eastling Bridge, you'll actually see them coming up and turning in the Alex Basin. And it's going to be a wonderful sight. Even today, with the smaller ships that turn at 300 metres, I think it's an incredible sight. So this is... The, the red line of the, the ABR project. Um, we're rebuilding 40% of the port's key walls. There's about 7,000 metres of key walls throughout the port, key walls and, and, and berths on jetties. We're re rebuilding 40% and 3,000 metres. We're going to do that in four years. This is an extraordinary amount of building in that period compared to what happened in the past. And I think we're just about on time doing that. We're going to have to move two ferry companies, each of whom have about 200,000 units a year through the port. We're going to have to move them to do that project. If we waited longer to do this project, we wouldn't be able to do it without asking one of them to leave the port while we're doing it. So we are heading, we did hit a really key point in the port in terms of timing. There's another one, a huge one looming, which I'll, I'll finish up on tonight. Um, one key figure down there, bottom of the page, the benefit to cost ratio, 2.8. So a very important part of, of our consideration of this was the, was the economic analysis of the benefits. And I'll, I'll focus in on that, compare that to our financial return shortly. So that's, that's all of the, the heavy infrastructure stuff from within the master plan. When we come to the port city integration, there's, we have a whole load of initiatives underway. Um, 29th of February this year, there's going to be an announcement about some, some music that we've commissioned. That'll be a, 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 big, a big gig in the National Concert Hall in June, so keep your eyes open for that. So we're involved in a lot of things outside of engineering, all aimed at trying to make this integration between the port and the city. But well, we've got eight little physical uh, projects here, and of those eight, a number of them are within the Alexandra Basin project. They're effectively committed at this point. They're industrial heritage projects, effectively committed from within that project, so they will happen. We have one project done, I'll show you that in a moment. 
And we're re-engineering the whole of the Ports Road network to make sure we're able to handle all of this, this volume in the future. So we've got to take out some roundabouts and put in some new roads and take out narrow bits. Because again, if we don't do it now, we'd be too busy to do it. So by 2040, we will have more than enough road capacity to move the stuff through the port into the tunnel, which is more than enough capacity to handle what we're producing. So again, just as that land side works. And, and looking at the just two of them, this one you might have seen on just Sir John Rogerson's Key. It's the diving bell that was innovated by Bindon Bloodstone in the 1880s. It's worked in the port for 70 years. I think it's a it's a beautiful piece of industrial part industrial heritage park sculpture. And Dublin's smallest museum is underneath it. If you haven't been in it, I'd, I'd recommend a trip. And there's some beautiful panels in it to explain what it's about. So this one has actually been been built. I mentioned Bloodstone in his diving bell, and the reason he had his diving bell was to prepare the, the bed of the river in order to take huge, great, big 350-ton concrete blocks. I don't know whether there are any Trinity engineers here, but you will all have seen the model in, in, in the engineering school in Trinity College. Beautiful model of the of two floats, a bell float and a, and a, a shear float, which together allowed the diving bell to be deployed in these 350-ton concrete blocks. So this is a rendering by, by architects of an industrial heritage compensatory uh, facet of the ABO project. So down the end, you can see a 350 ton concrete block, which we are going to resurrect from the key wall. We're going to have to, to basically demolish in order to make it deeper. We're going to put that within an area of public realm. There will be two, plat or two pavilions. The first one is concrete with a lot of glass, and then more concrete and less glass, and then you come to the concrete block. And this will be interpretive materials. With the, uh, we'll have interpretive materials within that. So it's the start of a trail. So you go from the diving bell down to the blocks. And I think this is going to be spectacular. Certainly renderings always make these things look nice. And here's a, it's a particularly nice one done by Sean O'Leary's firm, uh, Mala Architects. Beyond that, further down East Wall Road, we have received planning permission from DCC. We're getting ready to go to tender on a job to open the port centre building onto East Wall Road. Now, this does nothing for cargo handling capacity or, or anything else, but this is absolutely central, I think, to us maintaining that link with the city. Um, this was designed by, by Dharma, the architects, and what it will involve, this, this visualisation is at the bottom of Sheriff Street. At the moment, it's a, it's a T-junction with East Wall Road. So it's going to become a crossroads, and you will drive into the port uh, if you're on your coach going to cruise ship, you'll come in and out of that and make a, if you're going in, you'll make a right hand turn down to the river. We will be shutting Alex Road, so we'll be taking a lot of extraneous HGV traffic off East Wall Road, and all of that will go out, out through Promenade Road and the tunnel. And further down to the left of that, you can't quite get a sense of it here, but there will be uh, large gates which will open during the daytime onto the plaza around Port Centre. And Port Centre, I think, is actually a lovely building designed by Scott Tallon Walker. Uh, Neil Scott, Scott Tallon Walker designed it. But what we show here is, is an old crane which we're going to put, it's actually bigger than Port Centre, beyond right on East Wall Road, and a lovely uh, court and steel wall. I think it's going to be a fantastic piece of urban design. And the reason we need to do that is that the Docklands SDZ is filling out at an unbelievable pace. It's, the city is going to be down to us as sooner than we know it. And we need to be ready to make sure that we don't again face the idea that there's that bloody port that's in the way of good development. We've got to be proactive, and this is going to cost us a fair amount of money, but that goes back to our, our master plan commitment about, about integration. Planning for, for future growth. So I'm jumping from heritage. To, this is the one, the one slide of stats. The, the, the key thing about Dublin is that it is a gateway port to an island economy. That sounds a fairly simple concept, but it's vitally important. We're like we're like the port of Valletta is to Malta. We're like uh, Limassol to Cyprus. Okay, there is Belfast on the island, there is Cork, but Dublin is the biggest port on the island. We have a hinterland of the Greater Dublin area of 1.8 million people. And that's actually the same hinterland as the combination of Belfast and Larne, 1.8 in Northern Ireland. Uh, and and it, what we have is, is scale, location, and we have this incredible link with GDP growth. Um, I didn't mention I did mention statistics. Correlation coefficient: 99% between GDP growth 
and growth of volume in Dublin Port. It is just extraordinary. Um, and a huge history of compounding growth. And again, even with mathematically literate people, I sometimes find it difficult just to impress on them what has happened in the past with, with our growth. 3.2% on average from 1950 to 1980. 4.7 from 1980 to 2010. So looking at large 30-year chunks. And if I take, if you like, a personalized time style, I first became involved in the port in around 89 or 90. From 1990 to 2015, the average annual growth rate has been 5.8%. That's that chart on the right-hand side. Only two dips, one in 1992, which was all to do with the closure of the port uh, due to uh, restructuring of dock labor, and then the obvious dip that we all know about from 07. But even at this stage, we're 6.1% above our record year of 07. So it's caused us to reflect in, in that black box there on the assumptions in our master plan. When we did it, we thought 2.5%. We, we felt we couldn't come out and say it's going to be more. If you'd asked me at the time privately, we'd say, I think it's going to be more. But in those dark days, it was very difficult to retain credibility. If you're going to come out and say, you know, we had 400,000 people unemployed, our deficit was colossal, very black place at that time. I think it would have been very difficult to say to people and get them to believe you if you said, you know, I think we're probably going to be more like 4.7. So we went to 2.5 and that gives a doubling over 30 years. So that brought us to, to a 60 million gross tons by 2040. Now, we, we, we now have convinced ourselves, time will tell whether we're right, but, but one sense it actually doesn't matter. But we're now going to revise our master plan and we're going to increase our planning assumption to 3.3%. That takes to 60 by 2031 and to 77 by, by 2040. And, and the reason I say it, it actually doesn't matter whether we're right or we're wrong, so long as we have projects in the pipeline with our permissions on the shelf, ready to go, if our planning assumption turns out to be too high, well, you just defer by a couple of years. The big, design, the big delay in any engineering project is always on the consent side. So our complete focus now is on the on the consent side, get it to consent and having them ready to go. And if I take a quick look at how, how other European ports have planned for growth, two image, images there of Barcelona. Barcelona between 2007 and 2011 built two great big key walls, two great breakwaters. The south one 4.8 kilometers, the east one two kilometers, 523 million euros. And with colossal depths of water, gee, Mac, we, we could only look at with their eyes goggling, 22 metres and 25 metres. The big thing this has given Barcelona, in the bottom picture I've shown an arrow pointing to 250 he hectares of land that is not yet developed. But it's consented, and it's there to be delivered as and when it, it is required. Um, if I look at the little table, Barcelona, there's a figure there of 5.5. For every 1 million tonnes of throughput they had in 2014, they have the ability to deliver an extra 5.5 hectares. So this is, is it's, it's a, I suppose engineers love ratios. So O'Reilly's ratios, 5.5 for Barcelona. Copenhagen on a similar type of analysis, there's something like 3.1. Rotterdam with the mass flat to 2 development, which I'm sure you've heard about, 1.3. Dublin, didn't bother putting it on because Dublin is actually zero. We don't have that potential at the moment. Now, it's something I think we're going to have to get, and it's something that, when I mentioned my inflection point earlier, I'll, I'll come back to it in a, in, a, in a moment. So our volumes are growing fast in Dublin, and it takes us five to ten years to complete a major project. So just think about it. We need to start now to look at the projects coming after the ABR project. We've barely started work, and we must be looking ahead. In particular, we have the new city development plan, 2016 to 2022. It's out of consultation at the moment, consultation on the draft. That comes into effect the early part of next year. That's a very important plan for us. We have got to get the joined up thinking between us and DCC and NTA and Transport and Infrastructure Ireland if we're going to succeed in bringing projects through the planning system. So all of that has prompted us to think that Dublin, or the time has come to carry out this first review of the master plan. And a sobering thought. As I look ahead to the future, I think we are one major planning refusal away from serious capacity constraints. So we don't have the scope to get it wrong. We've got to get it right. And the challenge, as I said earlier, it's not on the engineering side. The challenge is in all those other things that might cause us not to get a, a, a permission.
So if I return to, to our, our, our fairly ugly um, master plan options, let's take it that the Alexander Basin project has been completed as described earlier. We have an option on the north side of the port to extend a container term, a little bit of infill involved, a little bit of a longer berth on the river, deeper water. That gives substantially extra capacity on the north side. I think we're probably going to apply for planning for that next year. The other project we have is the unified ferry terminal. We've got three ferry companies in the one area. We've got a building in the wrong place. We've got lots of internal roads. We take the building the roads out. We can generate more land and effectively push a lot of the, the stuff that shouldn't be near the key wall, push it back north away. And I think we'll probably go for planning for that next year. Once we've done those two, that's a decade of development of actual construction works in train. We then come to the Poolbeck Peninsula. And this is going to be a huge challenge for us. I think we can deliver maybe 18 or 20 extra hectares of land there. And the only option we had seen beyond that was back to the famous 21 hectare infill. Now, I'm fairly convinced at this stage that if, whoops, that's not the one I wanted. That's what I wanted. If, if we can do our two stage two projects and if we can get the Poolbeck Peninsula and get our developments there, from what we've done in the last couple of years and what we now understand, I think we can actually match our even higher estimate of 2040 within the footprint of the port without going near the controversial 21 hectares. Um, but within that is a big assumption, and that assumption is, is poor bag. So just to recap then, um, pulling a few thoughts together, the, the, the master plan has provided a very solid basis for us for the development of the port, and the first project is completed. Uh, we have limited options for expansion compared to other large ports. And I think we've got a big educational challenge. We've got to, when we bring projects forward, planners have got to understand what options we don't have. Uh, and we've got to make sure that in bringing the projects forward, we're not giving them the reasons to deny us our, our um, permits. Our stage two projects are clear and our planning time horizons are long. So we actually now need to plan because of the city development plan being reviewed we actually now need to be planning at the highest level for the 25 odd hectares we think we can, we can eke out of the, uh, of the Poolbeck Peninsula. So the commitment to maximize the footprint continues. The master plan will give us a great opportunity for a lot of public cons consultation, which we will do over the rest of this year. But equally, as we look at these, again, the famous inflection point comes into sight. So this is the city development plan 2016 to 2022 on the Poolbeck Peninsula. That's what the planners call SDRA 6, Strategic Development Regeneration Area 6. Pretty sure that will become an SDZ as the Docklands was, Strategic Development Zone. Um, a lot of our land and the four plots of land I've highlighted there, that if I go back to the old Triple DA and its master plan for the Poolbeck Peninsula, there are a lot of, I thought they were crazy ideas. I mean, that plan was something just credited. So, Maybe I shouldn't be too worried about call, calling their idea, the ideas in that plan crazy. But there was talk of, of residential and mixed use on the Poolbeck Peninsula. Beside the planning, the power stations I mentioned, beside the storage works, the incinerator. So we have a really big dialogue and challenge over the next year to convince the planners that you, you, we should be able to use our lands for port development. But we also need to be able to convince them. We can do it in such a way that achieves this integration I spoke about earlier. If we attack it on the basis that we're engineers, we know what's best for you, and we want to put concrete down there and cranes over there, we, we will fail. You've got to engage with them on the, the, these multifaceted aspects that we, we, we've spoken about. So the lessons we've learned from our ABR project, this is a slide um, that I actually use some of these figures with our board. We're a, a private company, we're a commercial company, balance sheet, profitability, cash flow are very important to us. And when we look at the, the, the projects that we need to build, all of the projects are about creating capacity, which is going to fill up slowly over time. And so I, I used a simple example in, in, in a discussion with the board. Imagine we were investing a million euros in a 30-year lifetime asset, and that was going to give a return of 100,000 yields. If you get that in year one, happy days, you're getting a 9.3% return, uh, return rate return. But if you're building in such that you reach your yield after in year 30, in other words, you're building it as we do build port infrastructure to go over time, your yield goes down to much, much lower figure. 
And it's absolutely inescapable that the project returns of the type of infrastructure we build, is, they're hopeless. Uh, the ABO project return rate of return, I have something like flinch when I look at the figure, it's about 0.1%. We had an alternative do minimum project, which we looked at. You always have to do this do minimum uh, comparison when, when, when you do the economic class. That would have yielded us 12.2%. So we have the, this dichotomy, what's good for the company and what's good for the country. So it's quite clear what's good for the company is not good for the country. And I, I'll go into this just in a moment again, and, and vice versa. So our focus is, is on return and capital employed. Because the internal rate of return approach on a project is not going to identify the right project for us. But the other one will. The cost-benefit analysis approach will. And our focus, therefore, is on the return on the overall capital we have employed. Look, maybe I'm, I'm talking too much about very simple concepts, but you have to, sometimes you have to explain this to, to boards and to bankers and to people who look and say, but you're just crazy guys in the public sector doing projects of no value. Well, actually, there is value, but it accrues to other people and comes, comes down the road. So, um, a grid. If, if I look at, at, think about the projects, and this is the thinking we had to do on, on the projects recently. The first thing you need to look at, does it pass the financial test? And you hope it does. If it passed the financial test, you, you really should look to see, does it pass the economic test? So the new trade facility I mentioned earlier, that passed both. It's making good, good returns for a small investment, making good returns. But our ABO project, on the other hand, definitely failed the financial test. No rational private sector owner of Dublin Port would do that project. But it definitely passes the economic test. Because if you don't do it, you've got a colossal amount of diversion. You have trucks going up to Belfast and Cork and wherever else, not going through the most economically advantageous place, which is Dublin. That's our ABO project. Our do minimum alternative that I mentioned would be the flip side of that. Would, 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 we'd have made our 12.2% return, but a lot of stuff would have been diversified. And then you have the worst case, fail, fail. And the best fail, fail example I can think of is probably the Channel Tunnel. What a complete waste of money. And I think, again, sometimes I have to put on my engineering hat look at what we're doing. You can get lost, I think, in, in the, the, the attractiveness of the, the challenge of doing an engineering project. But this cost-benefit analysis is causing us to focus very hard and very clearly, trying to make sure we've clear thinking. Got to pass the, the economic test. And if it also passed the financial test, happy days. But if it doesn't, it might still be the right project. So just, just a, few, a few reflections from our experience in the last couple of years. Um, it can be difficult to justify these sort of projects in financial investment terms. But because ports are so important in the supply chain, they must generate an economic return. Otherwise, we're wasting capital. And we, we've done enough of that in Ireland. And certainly within Dublin Port, we've got to be very careful that what we're doing is not wasting capital. We're not building white elephants or, or such. Like. And I actually, I'm actually, I've actually turned into a fan of our planning system. It comes in for an awful lot of stick. I actually think it's, it's pretty good. It's really helped us fine-tune our project. And I'm wondering to myself, why the planning system doesn't have take more of a view under the sustainable development heading of cost benefit analysis, economic side of projects. They tend not to. That's just a just a passing thought. So the discipline of cost benefit analysis and EIA, they were essential for us to produce a good project. Um, but you still have the challenge of getting the thing financed. And this is where the availability of low cost debt to a commercial company like us is so important. And we've got the EIB could not have been more helpful with us. And from their perspective, we couldn't be more helpful because we had a well-developed well project. It was easy for them to decide. But where the financial returns are poor, you sometimes need a kickstart. And the kickstart can come by way, by way of grant. Um, and there's other things happening within Europe. There's a thing called FC, which is essentially guarantees against debt, which share the risk and so the lender. And, and, and so, but all kinds of complex stuff, but all very essential for projects that have low financial returns. So financing is important, so also is policy coherence. And we don't always have it, but there are opportunities now, I think, to try to achieve that. Land use plan, very important. City development plan or SDZs, we've got to establish whether we have the ability to develop our lands in the Pool Bay Peninsula. Transport planning is really important. Um, expanded East Link bridge capacity. I don't think we get permission for projects in the Pool Bay Peninsula that generate more traffic if we don't have better connectivity. And this is where I'd be heartened by the NTA's draft transport strategy. Let's hope the draft gets taken off and they talk about putting in this, this 
more capacity at the Eastlink Bridge by about 2035, which kind of work in terms of our timing for our developments. The Eastern Bypass, you can hardly get away from it. Um, we're pushing openly and publicly for a decision to be taken on the Eastern Bypass. It was a big, big challenge for us in our Alexander Basin redevelopment project because it was lines and city development plans from routes for a possible crossing. It's been there for 30 odd years. We need to take a decision, either it's going to be built or it's not going to be built. For if, if we don't, we have this, this, this blight on the lands in Pool Bay for whatever they're used for, whether it's used for port development or mixed use residential or whatever else, there'll be somebody who'll put their hand up and say, well, we object to that because the Eastern Bypass has to go there. We absolutely, I think, need to take a decision once and for all. Is it going to be built? Is it not going to be built? And then get on on that basis. I don't want to have to go back to a board planola without hanging over a major planning application about a possible future Eastern Bypass. You have to use those two words together always, possible future. So just to summarize then, the financial, the operational, the economic, and the environmental concerns can't be separated in any, in any big, big project. The inflection point, so we're coming towards, towards the end. Um, port capacity. Ports are different to power stations where you have a rating and you know you can do 400 megawatts or 500 megawatts. <coughs> They're very different to, to uh, tunnels. For tunnels, you can think about road capacity and can pretty easily define what the capacity is. There's far too many variables within the port capacity equation and it's therefore very fuzzy. And that fuzziness and the difficulty of projecting volumes over such long periods as 10, 20, 30 years, that means that we need plans that are both flexible and have a lot of contingency built into them. I think a reasonable view, just reiterating a point, we think we can do 77 million gross tons in Dublin by 2040. Um, but we need to begin by 2030 to plan for the additional capacity that will have to be built and available in 2040 for the growth beyond that. And the options then are to go back to the famous 21 hectares or to build new port facilities elsewhere. Both of those are hugely challenging environmentally. Um, and the facilities, if they're going to go elsewhere, colossal challenge to build them financially. I think Dublin needs to get, and I don't have numbers in this, we need to get to some sort of scale. It's probably in the region of 70 million tonnes plus in order to have the financial strength to build new port facilities elsewhere. Because in Ireland sometimes, and we, we, we did it in Dublin, I was asked even this evening, what about this port that's going to be built? Is it up in Balbriggan or Braemore? Sometimes you have an ability to identify, come up with a notion, and then it all of a sudden becomes a vision. It's not just a notion, it's a vision. And they do it in the Nordic countries, they did it in that. And all of a sudden, the planning context can become very fuzzy, and we need very clear thinking. So what we do know is that the past initiative to infill the bay took 31 years to fail. When we come to consider whether we should go back to that, I think we need to evaluate that equally alongside the development of new port facilities elsewhere. So just taking a moment then, I think we need to think about what would a new port look like? Um, the first thing to be said is that I think Dublin Port will remain in the long, 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 long term, the deep water port on the east coast of Ireland. It would make no sense to have the benefit of three centuries of our, of our beloved Great South Wall and the North Bull Wall and the Channel Deep we're now going to do, and then to sort of say, oh, we should now build a second deep water port. Even thinking about it environmentally, that just doesn't make sense. You have it, so you put the deep ships there, put the ships in the handle to Dublin, put as many of them through Dublin as you can, and you build new additional facilities. And the nature of those facilities, if you consider Dublin as staying there, in the past people talked about moving Dublin, which never made sense, um, the new harbour would be designed to accommodate pretty shallow Roro freight ferries. And if you start to think about what, what's the scale of it, I, I think think in terms of unaccompanied Roro. So a trailer is pulled off a ship and is put there, waiting for the haulage to come and collect it. You need land to, to store that container, the transit storage. I think if there was a harbour, if I imagine a harbour with six berths on it, I can get about 200,000 units through each of those. Um, so that would give you about 1.2 million row row units. That's about 30 million gross tons. And at 20,000 units per hectare per annum, that's 60 hectares. So I think even at this stage, we can sort of postulate what might additional facilities look like in terms of scale. 
And in terms of location, I see it within a 50 kilometers north or south of Dublin. And as, as Dublin grows and expands, I think what you could well see is over the very long time, you might see a new harbour north and new harbour south and natural hinterlands coming out of those as, as the, the East Coast expands. And looking then at long-term capacity, I mentioned uh, 2015 with 32.8, 33 million gross tons, and I just jumped straight to the table. I said a couple of times, I think we can probably squeeze 77 million through Dublin. If we were to do the 21 hectare expansion, that would give us about 10 million extra gross tons. And if we built that new harbour I just described, that might give us another 30. That's 117 million gross tons. And at our master plan, planning figure of 3.3%, we'd reach that by 2055. That seems an awful long time away. And it's 170, that's an awful big figure compared to what's there. But if you went back an equivalent number of years to 1975, our gross tonnage in 1975 was 6 million gross tons, and our growth up to 2015 was 3.9. So it is entirely plausible that the figures I've just put out there will come to pass. Um, I've mentioned the port investment is expensive relative to the size of Dublin. And our large planning challenge in 2030 is to reconcile all of those environmental financial constraints. Say, what do we do in 2030? Do we go to 21 hectares as the first step with the view ultimately to have a harbour after, elsewhere after, or do we jump over for environmental reasons, perhaps the infill and go for an even bigger harbour? So these are the challenges that are going to emerge. And they're going to emerge as early as, as 2030. That, that's not... That's not very far away at all. It's only 15 years away. And in the meantime, we're going to be busy with lots of other things. But I think it's very important that we develop this, this, these views as to how things might pan out. We might well be wrong. I'm sure we know with certainty I'll be wrong. But I think the bold concepts that I've outlined there are not wrong and won't be wrong. So, concluding remarks, I'd be glad to hear. Um, the master plan we put in a short few years ago, it's a sound base for development of the first stage of port projects. And what I've described to you over the five years, 2016 to 2020, we'll spend about 300 million euros. The stage two on the north side, about another 100 million euros. So we've got about a decade of, of projects in the pipeline, which I am as certain as I can be of anything in the future are going to be needed. The planning lead times are very long, and we need now to consider the third stage, and this is the famous Poolbank Peninsula. Therefore, we're going to open ourselves up to quite a bit of debate as we produce a review of our master plan. I've already had given two presentations, one on Tuesday this week, to local area committees of Dublin City Council. And, you know, to start to put issues out there that guys are a bit uncomfortable with, and there's lots of objections, but I think we have to do that. I'm going to do a lot of that this year. Um, just reiterating then, having previously planned on the basis of 60 million by 2040, we're now saying 77 by 2040, and within the existing footprint of the port without going back near the, the, the infill of the bay. And the fourth stage of development of the master plan, that was returned to 21 hectares. So we think there's a very important message for us to get out there, particularly to people in the Clontarf area, Clontarf area who are very opposed. We think we can push down the line any consideration whatsoever of that until 2030. Just park it as an issue, take it off the agenda, and that will allow us then to focus in on, on the pool bank. But in that, those two sentences, there's going to be a real challenge now for planners, which we're going to put on. If we don't get the freedom to develop out the pool bank peninsula, we're going to have to consider that 20 hectares sooner rather than later, which we don't want to do. We, I, we don't think we need to do. So a lot of our efforts far away from engineering and all in, in planning and such matters. And then the final thing, maybe to end on a, on a slightly worrying note, we are one major planning refused away from major capacity constraints. Thankfully, these won't happen in my time on the job. They will happen afterwards. But I think if I go back to John Purser Griffith, we've got to be learning the lessons of the past. And what we do today, we've got to make provision for the, the, the generation of the future that come after us. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. And that's, that's it. Yes, thanks, Eamon. Um, so we might just throw it up to the floor. Actually, we might just, let's just continue down there. Uh, if anybody has any questions and answers, I think Aroy wants to take the things up. Part of your presentation, uh, there's just uh, two queries that I had. Um, one was it was in relation to the importance of, of the port for the competitiveness of the country effectively. 
which I don't think is captured in the Lachio or, or the other thing you were telling earlier in the talk. But currently, I think it's Europe only there with 27 million of a grant, or is only given 27 million of a grant uh, for, for, that, for, for stage one, which seems very low in the context of trying to improve competitiveness in the, in the Euro, in Eurozone. And the second point uh, that I had in relation to planning, I thought Dublin uh, was its own planning authority that it had to ask itself for planning. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. sure. if, if, if it was, it wouldn't, be, <laughs> wouldn't bother being here tonight. We are building stuff. <laughs> Um, going back to the, the competitiveness thing, I think where it is captured is within the um, the uh, benefit to cost ratio of 2.8. If 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 it doesn't happen, we showed a net present value of 677 odd million if it's built, that disappears. That value disappears, and that gets swallowed in in queues of trucks heading up to Belfast. Um, that there had been uh, when I first came into the job, there's a lot of talk for the sale of state assets. And, we must sell state assets to reduce the national and all this stuff. Um, and I am, my starting point is that I am a card carrying capitalist. I would strongly oppose the, the privatization of Dublin Port. It just makes no sense. But I imagine myself in the position as chief executive of the port company if it was private. We wouldn't be building these projects at all. I wouldn't go next or near the shareholder for any more money to build until I knew that once I built it and opened the gates, I'd have 100% utilization from day one. So it's the other side of that phenomenon I described earlier that kills the project returns. So I think where, where the competitiveness is, is driven within the project, it's avoiding the, the, I can't think of a better word, the consoles, the externalities, the negative effects of not building it. That's where the competitiveness comes. The second place it comes is within the port itself. The level of competition within Dublin port is phenomenal. Three container terms kill each other. In terms of rates. The rates are lowest I've seen in Europe, with the exception of the southeast of England, where they've just plummeted because of DP Worlds. And I think that's possibly another fail fail project from a little table earlier. There was just too much capacity there. So the competitiveness comes from within the port, the competition, and from having the port facilities in the right place. And the right place is 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 double. I, I think the particular constraint of importance changes from decade to decade. Our, our current one is, is probably land. Um, but as you build more land, you probably need some more keys. But the fundamental problem we have is land. I think um, and we're looking at the options of, of land outside the port. If you, um, I had the great good fortune to visit Valparaiso in Chile, where you have a tiny narrow strip. If you imagine the Andes come down to, to the Pacific, doesn't leave a lot of land for, for the building of, of storage areas for containers. They have a throughput per hectare per annum there, higher than you see in Singapore or Hong Kong. It's about 65,000 TU per hectare per annum. Dublin will get to about 15 at the moment. We have a target to bring it up to 40. They get that because they've built a place called Zaya. It's a logistic zone, unbelievably similar to Dublin insofar as it's linked by a tunnel. And it's a good bit away out of the city. And if you leave your import container there for more than 24 hours, they charge something like 100 bucks. That works. Back to economics and finance, not so much engineering, but the operation side of, of engineering. So the big thing is to move the, move the goods more quickly over the same footprint. So we're looking at options at the moment for, for inland ports or dry ports, they call them. In, in Dublin's case, they'll be road linked rather than, than rail linked. Right? They're just... It's just the nature of the geography of, of, of Dublin, the fact we have a tunnel and an M50. So uh, we're looking at those options, but I, I think that's where we would look, Julie, for, for additional capacity. Sorry. This was just a question. I need to step in here just so people can hear me at home. Um, 
Yeah, I suppose not having any of the legacy knowledge of the previous proposals, you, you seem to dwell a lot on the, the infamous 21 hectares and how problematic it was in the past in terms of getting the necessary approvals. I just wondered, um, because, and as I'm sure we all are aware, are aware there's plenty of consultants here uh, tonight, uh, um, there's a sophistication in, 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 you know, uh, gathering the pace in terms of the, the consultant engineering profession in terms of dealing with environmental concerns and interfacing with the with, with the, the relevant stakeholders and you know people are becoming more informed and more um, communicative and a lot of lessons have been learned and I just wondered are, you, you know and then also timing is everything in terms of as now we are at a point where we're in economic recovery mode and it's all about generation of jobs etc cetera, etc cetera. I just wondered is that the 21 hectares is the concept completely contaminated or is it, you know, uh, maybe if that's the appropriate terminology, or, or is it something that maybe would warrant a fresh set of eyes to be looked at, having regard to the change in current conditions in the market? Um, does, I don't think it needs a fresh set of eyes, but we certainly have to learn from what's happened. Unfortunately, I would know what, what Article 6.3 of the Habitats Directive is all about. Um, we, I think we have to accept that there are laws there. It may be, as a profession, we sometimes spend too long thinking, we bring a project to, let's say on board Planola, and we don't get permission. That's on board Planola's fault. Equally objectors to major projects which get, get passed by on board Planola will say, oh, that board Planola is useless to let that project go. At some point, we have to accept we have a planning system. We have the Environmental Protection Authority staffed by serious scientists. So if I apply that sort of view of the world, that we have to accept all this, and I look at the 21 hectares, that is the last thing we should be looking at. If I take the, the uh, appropriate assessment and all of that sort of hierarchy within the Habitats Directive, that would require us to get, go the old Europian route, part of reasons of overriding public interest. Galway is trying that at the moment in respect of its development, and we'll, we'll see how that goes on. But if you want to get planning permission for something that's in an SPA or an SAC, it's unbelievably difficult, and it has to be the last thing you look to do. That's what the law tells you. It is the last thing. So I, I think it's time to stop. Um, and I'd say this person, it's time to stop saying, ah, this bloody law is mad. You've just got to accept it. But I think as well, that once you've accepted, I think you need to look back. And one of the things we've done, we've engaged a lot with Birdwatch Ireland, for example. We're a project running over the last three and a half years called the Dublin Bay Birds Project. And there's a blog, and you'll find it on the website. And the, one of the reasons, probably the main reason we got involved with that was we needed to understand a world we didn't understand. And we needed to understand a world which, if we simply ignored it, would beat us. So I've had some great days bird watching, far removed from engineering. But we now look at projects and we will now say, geez, we can't do that because we, nobody needs to tell us. We now know we can't, we can't do that. We can't even think of that. So our Alexander based redevelopment project, the EIS for that was 1,200 pages. The appropriate assessment or the notorious impact statement was, was um, was about 500 pages. We identified an awful lot of issues that we knew were going to be problematic with the Eastern Bypass, for example. A huge amount of work went into that. The industrial heritage, we're taking away a lot of good industrial heritage, not protected, but nonetheless valuable. So we needed to address that, and we addressed that with the, the stony blocks I showed you, and also that we're going to reopen an 1880s uh, graving dock built by Stoney and, and Robert Mallet and, uh, and Dargan. So I, I think. If, if anyone was to ask my advice, and I'm not smart enough to give, give, give advice to people, the one thing I would say is on the environment is that you've got to embrace it. You've got to take it seriously. You've got to get stuck into it. When you employ your expensive advisors to do your EIS, if you are begrudging in what you allow them to do, chances are your EIS is going to reflect that. And that will be seen by a planning inspector absolutely clearly. And in their mind, I think they were looking at these guys aren't actually that serious for this whole process. Put yourself on the back foot. I'll give an example. We, we did, we did, we, we, Niall Brady, an underwater archaeologist, did about 100 dives from East Link Bridge out. And that was after doing all kinds of sophisticated scanning of the seabed to find anomalies. Did about 100 dives to check out each and every one of the anomalies found to make sure there wasn't a shipwreck down there. And again, it's, you know, you, you can sort of convince them, oh, shit, of course there's shipwrecks, it's a port that's been there for 300 years, that's just dredge and be done. But if you do that, you're, you're going to fail. So we got through our, our, um, our, our planning process, primarily, I think, because we gave the environmental consultants their head, we gave them the freedom, we gave them 
the open budget, because if you try and budget this stuff, it'll always surprise you. Uh, and that's how I think we got through it. So coming back to the 21 hectares, with all of that background, I don't particularly want to have to go back and look at that. We're going to do everything we can. And that's what takes us into the realm of fighting within the planning system, having a big open debate about the Prudbeck Peninsula and showing the planners, if you say we can't use it, look, look at the options you're pushing us towards. You're pushing us towards 21 hectares or you're pushing us towards Gorman's Town or Balbriggan with enormous uh, archaeological heritage issues with no certainty you could ever do a project there. So I think we have to push, not push back against plans, but we have to have a very open and strong debate and discussion with them. Not look on them as being people are out to get us. My experience with the planners is once you, you deal with them on, on their terms and they've got laws and so forth behind, you have some chance of, of, of succeeding. You have to go into it with, with, with uh, bona fides, I think. Anybody else have any more questions? Uh, Okay, well, I suppose just one for myself is more uh, maybe a, a, a sub part of some of the, the points you're raising. And uh, one of my colleagues there, from our uh, former colleagues from the NRA, will will will, will both affirm that the the trials and tribulations of dealing with matters such as archaeology and environmental concerns and whatnot. But uh, in rolling out the national road network, just the NRA and now TII, one of the things we would have observed as well would be the concept of induced traffic. You know, you know if you build it, they will come. And then obviously, so I just wondered how did that feature in 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 the the the, the, the financial and economic analysis of, or was that a component? Does such a thing a does such a thing exist in terms of induced traffic, where you're building or you're you, you know you're rolling out your plan or your Alexander Basin project, um, that you end up with more than you thought because you're offering such a pristine service or you have such a such a, a an upgraded facility. And then the other thing which I think you've kind of put the legs under was um, the matter of are you afforded an opportunity then, because you have such a, a high standard facility, to perhaps gain more commercially from it by, you know, charging for the privilege of it and knowing that people will, will need to use it, etc. Thus, providing you with more opportunity for funding to invest in your product, etc. So, I just wondered, was that a, a part okay. of the exercise? Um, well, on, on the induced traffic, that's never a phrase we'd use because that I think is a phrase that's completely in the realm of private car traffic. There is a natural demand of goods that were moved through Dublin if the facilities are available. So it's not induced. If it doesn't come, it's frustrated. So if you build the facilities, it's facilitated. So facilitated traffic rather than induced. And there are scale economies in Dublin. We've reasonably deep water. We've got four ferry companies. Um, I didn't give the example on the top, but and anyone here would like to come down for a visit to the port, I'd love you if you'd come. You know, thing you need to know is that our best visits start at quarter past five in the morning because between five o'clock and six o'clock in the morning, four ferries arrive in with 13,000 meters, 13 kilometers of vehicles on board, which get discharged in an hour. Half of that goes straight out the tunnel. So what's going to happen over time is that there's going to be more and more traffic through Dublin because that's where it makes sense. At the end of the day, what, what is the port? And you, you talk about higher profits and so on. Profit maximization is not part of what we're about, precisely because we've got such a strong, we don't have any real competition, to be honest with you, great competition within the port. So we need to balance what our charges are in respect of the investments that we make to get an appropriate return on capital employed. Um, if we lose control of ourselves, let's start to input, put up our prices. We then bring ourselves into difficult territories where competition, or I think, would probably step in. Uh, and the thing we wouldn't want is regulation. I think we have too many examples of bad regulation in Ireland. So we operate very openly within this space of we're an infrastructure provider. The demand for our infrastructure is a derived demand. In a bit of mathematics, mathematics coming. It's a derived demand for the demand for transport services, which itself is a derived demand. So we're a second derivative of what's happening in the real economy. <coughs> Shipping is unlike air transport. Michael O'Leary can generate growth. You can generate new markets. You can't do that in shipping. The key thing in shipping and in transport is to reduce the cost, keep your supply chains as competitive as possible. If we build too much infrastructure, it simply will sit there. And there's lots of examples around. I mentioned London Gateway as well. Go down to the Spanish ports. Have a look at the European Court of Auditors reports on EU investment in some Spanish ports. And I'm sure you've seen some of the Spanish airports with tumbleweed on them. There's lots of examples. If you get it wrong in this sort of big infrastructure, 
It just will not attract the traffic at, at any price because it'll be in the wrong place. Um, <coughs> did I answer the two questions there in one? Yeah. I hope I did. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, Jim, do you want to take a seat? Sure. Oh, Hi, Carol Kessner and Zamira of Zambia County Transit. I just, given your expertise, be interested in hearing your opinion on what you might see or what you think Zamira Report could do that might complement the operations. Is it a product that competes because they don't have competition? Oh, as, some, as somebody born in the borough? Brought up in the barrel and living in the barrel, I'd love to avoid that question. I, I think you need to go back. Let's let's look at history. Well, why was why was Dunleary built? Dunleary was built as a port of refuge. The Great South Wall had been built, and if you go down to Sea Point, and there's a lovely plaque there, get my date right. It was November, November the nineteenth, eighteen something that I can't quite remember. Sorry, eighteen eleven, I think. There was a lot of prime numbers I do remember, but there was two two ships foundered. There was the, the Rochdale and the Prince of Wales. So one foundered at the Martello Tower in Seapoint, the one a little bit further down. So a lot of those bodies are buried in Carrick Brennan Cemetery and some behind the Tower of Towers. Huge outcry, human cry, you know, sailing ships, dangerous place, built on Leary as, as a harbour of refuge. Now Don Leary was built beautiful harbour, absolutely magnificent. And they developed a very strong passenger business, the mail packet. Mail packets de deliver that business, and it's kind of gone through a natural cycle. The ships have got bigger. Stena relocated into Dublin Port. The the big issue with Dunleary in terms of of providing additional capacity for freight or for passengers, it's the road network and the connections and the lack of open space. So there have been a, there has been a lot of talk recently, and certainly a lot of a lot, lot of energy. To me, the future of Dunleary has got to be around marine leisure and tourism. It's got to be. It's just a quite a magnificent harbour. And I did, certainly it should never be, be for freight. I'm not sure it should ever again be for, for car ferries because Seapoint Avenue and so on is, 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 is uh, just not appropriate. I think to me the model for the is Holt. It's a pretty close model. Look at what Holt has done. It's, 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 it's fantastic. So, no, I, I don't think there is that, that, that complementarity between Dublin and O'Neill at all. They're just two very different animals, two very different requirements.